Load Intensity and Performance in Professional Road Cycling. This is the title of today's episode number 29 with Tön van Erp, a former sports scientist at Team Sunweb who developed his PhD around this topic using data from pro cyclists. So unlike most of the episodes so far, today we are focusing a bit less in nutrition and more on some of the physiological and training related aspects of cycling. But with Tön's experience dealing with some of the best riders in the pro peloton, I believe we'll get some important and useful insights on what it takes to win a grand tour and the behind the scenes work that we normally don't see so i truly hope you find this talk interesting and useful welcome to fuel the pedal podcast Welcome back to Fuel the Pedal. Thank you again for being on that side listening to my ramblings. I am still your host, Gabriel Martins, that Portuguese nutritionist broadcasting from Madrid. And today we are at episode 29 on an episode more into the physiological aspects of training and performance in cycling that are critical for winning a Grand Tour. And we'll hear about it from someone who has some remarkable in-field experience monitoring pro cyclists and contributing to leading them to victory in a team that has not only male but also female cyclists, which will be great to obtain both perspectives. I first heard of Turn uh, during the Science and Cycling Conference in Brussels last year, 2019, and he presented some really interesting data while working with uh, Team Sunweb. Now, while working in Team Sunweb, Turn contributed to victories in all major aspects of elite cycling, with the biggest highlight perhaps being winning the 2017 Giro d'Italia, the polka dot jersey and the green jerseys in the Tour de France with three world titles. Today's episode title is exactly the title of uh, Turn's uh, PhD research, so stay tuned for the next hour. But before we get into our talk with Turn, I would just ask for your attention for a couple of minutes. I am really into helping fellow research colleagues around the globe to perform their research and for that reason I'm more than happy to lend a hand in sharing any links for online surveys of your research, so feel free to contact me if that's the case and I'll be glad to mention them here and include those links in the show notes of each respective episode on fieldapedal.com. So here are some of the ones I've collected over the last two weeks that I've uh, already retweeted on Fuel the Pedal's uh, Twitter profile. The first one would be from uh, Christy Reynolds, uh, Dr. Lewis James and Dr. Stephen Mess from Loughborough University and they encourage cyclists to complete their quick online survey so uh, they can better understand your nutritional needs during training and competition. The next one would be from uh, Vlad Sabo from University of Exeter who is uh, supervised uh, by uh, Dr. Joanna Botel who was a guest on the previous episode here on Fuel the Pedal and they're calling for sports nutrition practitioners, strength and conditioning coaches and athletes to take part in studying attitudes towards the use of touch cherry supplements. Now notice there will be a link for practitioners and another link for athletes as well. The next one was sent from Jeff Rothschild, who, along with Ed Maunder from the AUT Sports Performance Research Institute New Zealand, are investigating the reliability of a three-minute critical power test performed at home. So if you have an indoor trainer, you can take part by performing this uh, three-minute test and sending them the data. And finally, Andreas Kreuzer from Texas Christian University is performing a survey on training, nutrition, recovery, and sleep practices. So all the links for... Each of these surveys will be available on fieldapedal.com in the blog post of this present episode 29. Now, bear in mind that today's episode was launched on July the 15th of 2020, so if you're hearing this far into the future, understand that these links might not be available anymore and this research data collection might be over. So now we are finally ready to start our interview, Load Intensity and Performance in Professional Road Cycling with Turn van Erp. Apologies to the Dutch listeners for my bad pronunciation. Up next on Fuel the Pedal Podcast. Hi Turn, we finally made it. Welcome to Fuel the Pedal. How are you doing today? I'm fine, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. 
No, thank you, Turn, for accepting being here despite the current situation. It's great to talk to you again after uh, last time I saw you in Brussels for the, the Science and Cycling Conference, as I was uh, telling the listeners. It wasn't your first time presenting there, Turn, was it? No, I've been to um, the first one, I think, in England, and the second one in, when the Tour de France started in uh, Utrecht, in the Netherlands. Yeah, for those of us who are into cycling, that conference is just a reference and a great opportunity to listen to some of the best researchers and people who work with pro cycling, just like you did back then. So, uh, Tun, could you introduce yourself to the listeners and tell us a bit about your work in cycling and research experience? Yeah, so I'm Tun, I'm 35 years old now, and I worked in Team Sunweb and predecessors, so like in the beginning it was Argo Shimano, um, for nine years as a sport scientist. And then, yeah, I helped the team improving in the sprint and team time trial and time trial, like all the science stuff. But during those years, I also collected really a lot of data, uh, mainly about um, training and race data, the power files. And somewhere five years ago, I decided to, to use that resource to, to do science. And that science is exactly what we're discussing here today. And where are you based now, Turn? Yeah, so I'm now in Stellenbosch, South Africa, now working as a postdoc at Stellenbosch University. So in December, I quitted my job at, at Sunweb to do something else. And now I'm yeah doing full-time science with the data set I collected at the team. Outstanding turn. So you have a really perfect mix between a science research and practice, having already worked with a Pro Tour team that will allow us to have a really complete view over today's topic. So ever since I began with this podcast last year, we've been mostly focusing on nutrition-related aspects, sometimes with a detour to other topics, but I've always felt that we needed an episode on the fundamentals of cycling physiology, training loads, and just having someone explaining how physically demanding cycling really is and what does it take to win a grand tour so that we can better understand how nutrition should be adapted accordingly. So one day while scrolling through ResearchGate, I saw that Turn had published his whole PhD thesis, 185 pages of pure cycling physiology. I didn't read it back then, of course, but uh, just going through the table of contents, I thought, well, this is just what I was looking for. And so I decided to contact Turn and he kindly accepted to be on the podcast all of this way before this whole unfortunate situation with coronavirus pandemic but now we can finally make this happen so last year during the science and cycling conference in brussels a turn gave two brilliant presentations one about science specific for women's cycling which we will tackle here as well and another talk pretty much on the topic that brings us here today load intensity and performance characteristics in the fight for the victory in multiple grand tours so today we'll go through the training characteristics of pro cyclists, loads, the power zones of cyclists when competing. We'll talk about gross efficiency of pedaling, women versus male road cycling, reliability of some training parameters, and some other really interesting geeky stuff. Since Turn has some remarkable experience working directly with pro cycling, having one particular rider winning a Grand Tour will sure have a much more applied perspective. So Turn, since this episode is going to be pretty much around the article, that were part of your PhD thesis. Perhaps we could start by having you uh, give us a quick overview on what you set out to do and what aspects did you went on to study so that we can tackle each one of those topics throughout this episode. Yeah, so my thesis is basically the first two chapters are about how heavy or how intense and how much load a race is. So I looked at this Grand Tour winner and looked about the load and intensity which he's doing in the Grand Tour. And the second one, I looked at all races combined of male cyclists and I compared it with female cyclists because I knew from uh, from working in the field that the women's races are, it's the same spot, but the women's races are totally different if you compare the load and intensity. So that's kind of the first two chapters. And because you saw in the uh, second chapter that uh, the load was so different in races, I was wondering if then the girls, the women also train differently. So that was the third topic. I compared the training of the male and the female. And then the last three were basically about load and how you can use it and how accurate or reliable the load measures are. So with the introduction of the power meter, you have the TSS. It's possible to measure TSS and kilojoules. 
but you still have also the possibility to use heart rate measures or measures based on subjective feeling like uh, the session and RPE. Um, so I, I looked at those four load measures and looked how they are relating together and what are the disadvantages of each load measure and advantages. And lastly, I looked if load has a relationship with getting injured or getting sick. So that basically was like, yeah, the outline of my thesis really fast. Interesting that you point that out. Uh, there's something I've been noticing more and more in cycling, which is this integration of sports scientists and professionals with really high credentials. Some teams even asking for a minimum of a, a master's degree or a PhD as a mandatory prerequisite, and even for some nutritionists working in pro cycling. Have you noticed this as well in the past few years? Yeah, I think 10 years ago, maybe longer, riders were more like searching themselves and surrounding themselves with trainers or nutritionists or maybe sports science, but not that much, I think. And nowadays you see, like, I think maybe our team was one of the first with Ivan Spakerbrink as a small team. He really wanted to gather all the data, uh, all that, that knowledge in a team. So I think when we started, I was maybe one of the first spot scientists in a team. And we had directly also a nutritionist in a team. But nowadays, almost all teams uh, will provide it to the riders, that knowledge. So, yeah, I think the cycling in general made like really big steps in the last 10 years. For sure. The impact, at least from my perspective, was a tremendous and the advances in sports nutrition related research might have contributed to that as well. And since you have experience working at a pro two level along with your career as a researcher, do you see cycling that much different now in terms of the training process, all the monitoring tools available uh, during training that we have nowadays in comparison to, let's say, 20, 30 or even 40 years ago uh, when we had much less technology and scientific knowledge available i think what has changed is that now especially with the power meter but also with the heart rate monitor it's so easy to kind of control everything so if a trainer wants to have this specific trainer it's so easy to afterwards see if the rider did that training and did it in the right way and that way you can really control your training your training load the training intensity to be optimally prepared for, for, for the races which are coming. Um, so I think that's really something which improved. I also see some still some more improvements possible. But I think that's the main thing changed in the last 20 years. Turn, still talking about the power meter, uh, since there has been some talk about the UCI considering forbidding the use of power meter during cycling racing, how do you believe this is going to affect the teams and what alternatives do teams have to monitor the workloads of their riders? First of all, I really think it's something the UCI is overreacting in because we use the power meter and the monitoring really a lot in training, but in racing, it's still really difficult because you, as a rider or as a sport director, you have 20 other teams which, which can do things. And it's not, I don't think it's that controlled because of the power meter. And I don't think races will change if they will ban the power meter. And yeah, if they ban the power meter, you can still, of course, collect the heart rate. And maybe they're also going to ban that. But let's say, I think I think if I look to my experience, the main thing which is going to happen that we really use it a lot in time trials to make the pacing. And the basic plan and riders were, were focusing on the power then because then you're alone on the road. Um, but in a normal stage race, to my opinion, it's not going to make a big difference if, they, if they're going to ban it. At least not a difference. It's like the race will still really be controlled by the strongest team, to my opinion. Yes, and I apologize to the listeners for insisting in this matter before getting into today's topic, but I really think this is worth insisting because not only for power, but also for monitoring loads, the, the power meter is essential for us nutritionists working with cyclists since the kilojoules obtained after each session allow us to calculate with precision the energy expenditure during a race, which in a multi-stage race uh, will even have an increased importance in allowing us to adapt energy intake for the rider to be able to maintain its power to weight ratio and therefore its competitiveness so uh, from my perspective yeah. i don't know if you agree <laughs> no no I, I totally agree on the nutrition side because that was also the way we were using the data after the stage so yeah yeah that that's probably going to change because it's then more difficult to to calculate uh, the kilojoules which which they used um but i think the reason to why they want to ban is because they think the power meters make make the race uh, boring or boring controlled by some big teams and i don't see that changing with banning the power meter 
but but yeah you're right uh it gives like nutrition wise it gives a lot of valuable information yeah that's true Yes, and quoting one of the people backing this ban, it annihilates the glorious uncertainty of sport, which I totally agree with you uh, that perhaps it won't change a thing and strong teams will always be in the lead and controlling the race regardless of power meters. Anyway, uh, we digress. <laughs> Let's start tackling this uh, right from the beginning of your work and this could also be the million dollar question in pro cycling. What does it take to win a Grand Tour? And one of the first studies of your thesis is a case report of a professional cyclist competing during the 2015 Vuelta a España, the 2017 Giro d'Italia that you went on to win, and the 2018 Giro d'Italia and Tour de France. And this was the first study describing the individual load, intensity, and performance characteristics of a general classification contender during multiple Grand Tours. So, Tun, what can you tell us about some of these parameters you looked at in this particular rider and the million-dollar question, of course? What does it take to win a Grand Tour. Yeah, first, what I find really interesting is that it seems that all the Grand Tours are have the same amount of load. You know that people talk about like this Grand Tour is way more heavier than than this Grand Tour, but at the end we we looked at on stage 19 the difference is only 2,000 kilojoules, which is like almost nothing. After that, it, it, the difference will be a little bit more because some Grand Tours end with a time trial on Saturday and then a really easy day on Sunday. And some have like a hard day on Saturday. If they make the, the race really hard with a really a lot of mountains, the riders will slow down. Let's call it that, slow down. And when they make it really kind of easy, the riders will speed up in those few climbs which they have. So I think that's really an interesting thing what you see in GC contenders. At least in this GC contender. And what also I found interesting is that on the last mountain, so what I did in my study was analyze the power output on the key mountains. So on the last mountain or the last mountain and then a descent. And what you see there is that the power output can vary a lot. For example, a 20 minutes climb or 25 minutes can be as high as 6.3 watts per kilogram, but also can be 5.5 watts per kilogram. And you're pretty sure that they went all out because it's the last mountain. And that difference is mainly because what happened before the, before the key mountain. Um, so when you put a lot of climbs before the key mountain, the power output on the key mountain will be lower. So in this case, this rider is losing 0.23 watts per kilogram per thousand altitude meters before the key mountain. So I, I, to my opinion, those two things were like the, yeah, interesting findings. Well, there are a lot of interesting findings there yeah. that we could discuss for hours here, but I'm stuck with what you said regarding the fact that this particular rider was only losing 0.2 to 0.3 watts per kilo per 1,000 altitude meters in each mountain before the key mountain, which for many of us might not appear much, but in that context is the difference between winning or losing. Don't forget that we are still talking about maintaining around 6 watts per kilo. And for most of us, it's still a barbaric amount of power that we wouldn't be able to maintain for one minute, let alone during 25. So... Another interesting finding uh, that caught my attention was that although this rider was competing for the GC, for the listeners I mean the general classification, he spent approximately 80% of the time in the low intensity zones from zone 1 to zone 3, only 10% around FTP which could be zone 4 and the last 10% was spent in the highest power output zone or above FTP zone 5. And this may come as a surprise for some of the listeners and clearly show us the sparing nature of cycling and how GC riders are doing almost a different race here unlike sprinters and their own domestics who as you wrote pace mountain stages to be within the time limit and therefore don't have to compete maximal in every stage so what can you tell us about these different rider profiles and their individual efforts during racing yeah so I think the the percentage is so high in the lower zones because you have those flat stages and stages where they are really protected well and they really they really have a high level of course so they will only be maybe domestics are already on ftp or above ftp then like this rider is still below so that's why i think this big part is in the low intensity zones <laughs> and if you look like comparing a gc contender to like domesticers or sprinters i think two specific riders have it really tough in the Grand Tour. That's the GC contender because he has to compete every day. Sure. Well, a domestic 
if he gets dropped, then he can take it easy and ride kind of easy to the finish line. And you have this sprinter type, which has to fight every mountain stage to be within the time limit. So I think when you're going to look at the at the sprinter, he will have a totally different uh, intensity distribution compared with domestic or GC contender. Really interesting stuff, Tun. And besides that, I'm really curious to get into the comparison between female and male riders. But before we get to that topic, there's a much older research of yours, uh, which I'm curious, uh, just to have a quick comment from you. And it's regarding the cycling growth efficiency, which is an essential parameter for us nutritionists, since we need to know this value of growth efficiency, along with total work in kilojoules, to accurately calculate the energy expenditure during training or racing. And it's a value that normally ranges between 18 and 22 percent and your work focuses on the variations in uh, cycling growth efficiency in pro cyclists so uh, my question here would be are there any variations in growth efficiency that are worth considering and that can directly affect the energy expenditure of each rider yeah so i think with growth efficiency it's important that to know that you have this study i don't know pretty long ago but that shows this inverse relationship with with the vo2 max so a rider with a really high vo2 max will have a slightly lower growth efficiency and the opposite so when you want to calculate the energy expenditure the best would be if you let do the rider do the growth efficiency test himself and that you can have for every power output in the race you know is growth efficiency that kind of would be the best then you can pretty precisely calculate uh, how much energy you burned in the race got it so let's stick with that idea that growth efficiency needs to be calculated in each rider for the different power zones in order to see the variation in each zone and then estimate the energy expenditure so perhaps we could finally tackle this central topic in our talk today the comparison of male and female cyclists in terms of training and racing which you brilliantly present in your phd thesis and the reason for me to find this really important to discuss is perhaps because because there is still so little data on physiological parameters and just training data on female cycling, much like the lack of data on the effects of certain dietary supplements on exercise performance in women. So I believe you can provide us with some very useful insights on this. On a side note, and if you're interested in just reading some more data on performance and physiological parameters on professional female cycling, I know that Brian Saunders' group from the University of Sao Paulo, who has been here on the podcast before, published a preprint on this and the title is The Road to the UCI Profiling a Professional Brazilian Female Road Cycling Team. So just in case you want to check this one out, you can check the bottom of this episode side notes on fuelthepedal.com where I usually include references and articles mentioned during the episode. So moving on to your data turn, you went on to compare the training characteristics of male and female professional road cyclists during a four-year retrospective analysis. So so I'd like to try and have you provide a multidimensional approach to this matter. So what particular differences in both genders would you highlight here? And from someone who has been in close contact with female cycling, how do you see this evolution of female cycling and the challenges it still faces? So I looked at the races of male and female cyclists and I compared the load and intensity. And of course, the load is lower in female races because they are shorter, but the intensity, it's way higher. So they spend in hard rate zones, they spend like all around 15% more in zone four and like 10% or 15% more in, that, in zone five. So their races are, are less controlled. And because they are, sh they, they are shorter, for example, in a flat stage, they cannot let the breakaway get five minutes because then this race is too short to get the breakaway back. So they race from the start and I also think because the problem in women's cycling is now some are getting paid okay let's let's say it okay maybe still not enough mm -hmm. but some are like they are not really paid so the girls that get the, getting paid can train like a professional but the half of the bunch cannot do that so the differences in level in the in the women's peloton is still pretty big so you will get high differences in intensity because for the strong girls it's not that intense but for let's call it weaker girls it their races are really intense so you have multiple factors influencing influencing this so i think you ask about um, the difficulties in women's cycling in in general i think the last five years women's cycling made made pretty big steps 
and and also the UCI now I think it started this year as this obligation and salary demands for teams in women's cycling at least if they want to be world tour so I think this is a pretty good step but it's kind of vicious circle right if they don't broadcast the races then teams or like sponsors they are not willing to pay that salary because they don't get the revenue back from people that watch the races and um, so I think it's a good step to have this obligated salary but I think more important is to to have this World Tour races obligated that it is broadcasted and to combine it maybe with the male races. So, or combine the broadcast with the, with the male races. So, you have a lot of viewers. I think that would maybe be a better start than directly ask teams to, to pay the salary uh, demands. Because if there's no possibility to watch the race, then for the sponsors, there's not really um, interest. Yeah, interest to pay the salaries. So I think it's this vicious circle, but the most important is that it, that it is broadcasted. So to my opinion, UCI should say, all right, if you want to be a world tour race in women's cycling, you have to broadcast it so people can watch it. Well, I truly hope that many female cyclists are listening to this episode. And if they are, uh, they're certainly loving your words and your much needed appeal that is now immortalized in this episode. And hopefully taking into account your close experience with this reality, we can contribute uh, to this next step in female cycling, which would be the broadcasting of female cycling races. And with this, uh, contribute to elevate this branch of professional cycling. And turn, do you believe that someday women's cycling races will approach the total distance of a man's cycling races or perhaps i should do this question in a different way does female cycling racing formats need to become similar to those of male cycling i don't think it has to be as long as the men's races but if you it depends on what you want if you i think the women's races now are maybe more interesting to watch because there's always something is happening so shorter races can have maybe this more interesting races to watch but i think at least if they make it a little bit longer then you will get more the same load and intensity distribution as as you see in the male races Uh, but I don't think you should make races of 250k in women's cycling, but at least go up to maybe 180 for the classics and 150 or 60 for the normal races. Now, the differences are too big. I think the average race in women's cycling is only 115 kilometers. That's pretty short. It's a totally different sport compared with the average race of 180 minutes in male cycling totally different sport different intensity and totally worth watching so let's see what the future holds for female cycling but here at fuel the pedal we are rooting for you and even willing to support any initiatives by mentioning them here on the podcast so there's another topic we've been discussing here lately on fuel the pedal which is the issue of low energy availability and red s in cycling and red s stands for a relative energy deficiency in sports turn so did you ever experience that male and female riders in the teams that you've worked with showed an increased risk of a red ass and did you ever add to take any preventive measures in your team alongside with the team's nutritionists to face this yeah so i i think it's a problem in professional cycling because how the sport is in the team this was more part of the nutritionist but i think what what's really important is to have that moments in the season to to get the pressure off so like what we especially in the beginning of what we always do in October, riders have to be in the off season. They have to take like three or four weeks holiday off the bike and don't focus on weight. I think that's that's a good start. And sometimes yeah, you see riders coming back in December like, okay, you really did it focus. But in, in, in that part of the season, it doesn't really matter. And you give the body the time to recover a little bit. And I think um, you should focus to certain moments in the season, some periods where you want to be top shape, but don't exaggerate it and, and be the whole season in, in top shape and like with really low body fats, because that makes it it's for sure unhealthy. But if you focus only for a certain period really on it and you give the body the time to recover in certain moments, you have lower amount of risks. Yeah, sure. Some really interesting points there. And this is also a, a problem for me and something I don't hear being that often discussed, which is some of the young riders, they just want to look like their idols and they create this idea that it's normal to chronically overtrain and restrict their food. I mean, they really... Yeah. Weigh... It's insane. It's crazy. Yeah, but we... 
I think it's important that those young riders realize that those pro riders are not always that skinny. They are skinny in certain periods, but not the whole season. Absolutely. I mean, everything has its moment and no top shape is eternal. So we reached a point on this episode where I get completely out of my comfort zone as a nutritionist since this is really specific stuff about training. And a considerable part of your thesis goes around the concept of training load and the reliability of using measures such as RPE, heart rate and power output, where you then talk about the kilojoule spent and the TSS or the training stress score to measure training load during training road racing and time trials in the cyclists you've worked with. So could you please talk us through each one of these measures and how can they be used to monitor training loads during training and racing? So yeah, for trainers, uh, of course, the training load is really important because they measure how much load or how much training a certain rider did. And in my thesis, I use like four ways to calculate it. There's the RP scores. You ask a rider from 1 to 10 or 6 to 20 how heavy the day was, and then you multiply it with the amount of minutes. Then you have the heart rate score I used is Lucia Trim. You divide the heart rate in three zones, low intensity, middle and high, and every minute in the zone. Uh, in zone one you get one point every minute in zone two you get two points and every minute in zone three you get three points and then uh, and then you have a total score and then the tss is invented by training peaks or by the by the makers of training peaks Mm -hmm. so it's kind of related to your ftp which is your one hour power output your best one hour power output and if you ride one hour on that you get collected 100 points and i looked to all four of them and correlated them all in training races and time trials i watch it kind of what what i kind of find is that they are all have a really good correlation with each other and that's basically because they all the most important thing in the measures is is the amount of minutes the duration so they all have that in in common so i think in pro cycling maybe because the races and the trainings are so long the amount of duration is blending the way you measure the intensity the rpe or the the zones so that's one of the things i found is that it could be that yeah the duration is so important that that's the reason why they have such good relationships with each other. And then what I saw is for the subjective ones, so session RPE and for heart rate is not subjective, but like and heart rate, the relationship with the power measures is getting less in races. And it's probably because you cannot control the intensity that well. So, for example, the RPE, if I ask a rider in the first week of the Tour de France, how hard is this stage? It will be easier than in the last week. And for heart rate, it's affected with for example, taking caffeine before or in a Grand Tour, the heart rate is um, suppressed. So in the beginning, the maximum heart rate will be higher than in the end of a Grand Tour. So that will affect also the load measures. Tun, and do you think that TSS is a good, reliable measure to use to monitor training? Or do you perhaps see some limitations worth considering? All the measures have this advantage and disadvantages. And the disadvantage from TSS is that it's intensity squared. So if you do a really intense race, you will collect way more points than doing a really slow endurance ride. Well, you burn the same amount of kilojoules. So it can be that trainers which are only focusing on TSS underestimate the load of a really easy six or seven hours endurance ride because you collect maybe only 200 points. Well, you do a short high intensity ride you'll collect a lot of points. The strong thing about TSS is that Tayo Sanders, who I'm co-ordering with Mm -hmm. sometimes, he did a study and TSS had the highest relation with the response. So you have to be careful with all the load measures. And that's why I'm writing in my thesis that I think uh, coaches should use them combined with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some really important considerations for all the coaches listening to this episode regarding the limitations of each method and the importance of combining these measures, as you've mentioned. So one of the reasons for which training load may be important to monitor is the increased likelihood of injury and prevent it. Some of your research looked exactly at this in female cyclists. So can you tell us a bit about how did you measure training load and injury and even the likelihood of getting sick? So I measured training load in this particular study based on the session RPE. And so what you do is measure every day how hard they train. And then you have an acute load, which is kind of the load for seven days. They have the chronic load. It's the load for four weeks, so 28 days. 
And then you can divide them together and then you get this ratio. So if the ratio is one, you did the last week exactly the same as the previous four weeks. If it's uh, 0.7, you did 30% less. If it's 1.3, you did 30% more. And there is some discussion about this way of measuring load. But what my uh, study found is that when you are above the 1.3, so you do 30% more looking to the, the previous four weeks, then you have this five times more uh, likelihood to get injured. Um, so it's a recommendation to train us to, to look at this ratio and make sure riders are not, not above 1.3. I know it's not always possible because of the races you have and when you're coming out of the off season, for example. But the relationship was pretty good, to my opinion. And what I also found is that in my study, there was no relation at all with getting sick. So I had the feeling for my, my time at the team that riders were getting more often sick after training camps, for example. But in my study, in female cyclists, I could not find any relationship between the load a rider does and the chances of getting sick. Yeah, I'm glad that you've mentioned training camps. In particular, I'm referring to the altitude training camps, which is something I feel that we still don't have much data on. Did you monitor training load or other physiological parameters differently, taking into account the physiological stress that altitude already poses on the riders? Um, yeah, so we before the altitude camp, we always, always measured the iron um, in the blood. So you're sure that they when they go to altitude, that, that it is on a good level, because that's necessary. Mm -hmm. And we were really focusing on the load in the first weeks um, in combination with um, saturation measurements. So at least we know that it's important that the saturation is above a certain number before you start the kind of the high intensity trainings. Outstanding turn. And just before finishing, I think it would be important to have just a quick comment from you regarding how quarantine affected riders and what things should be considered in this return to play or in this case return to ride in preparation for the completely changed and weird racing calendar we have this year. And another thing that concerns me is that this season is being pushed forward and the following season, probably if things go back to normal, is going to happen in its regular schedule. So cyclists may have less time of a transition. How do you see this transition for riders in terms of having less time to recover between seasons? Yeah, so I, I think if, how I know the cyclists for them, it's the most hardest to stay still and don't have the possibility to train that much. And training on the rollers is mentally really heavy. I think what the best thing for cyclists to do in this period, at least if it's not too long, is just to relax and do the time on the bike when they are mentally prepared for it. Because they, they're still, if you get come out of lockdown now, there's still time enough to get ready or time enough if you have a good shape, a reasonable shape. You still have time enough to be ready for the races in August. And you should take uh, into account that the race calendar has moved, like, totally. So you have probably from August, you're racing till August next year. So, like, 12 months in a row, or maybe maybe longer, September. So, 40 months in a row. So the season's going to be really long next year without really possibilities to recover. So I think it's it's smart to start kind of this fresh as possible in August, but with a good shape. So I think that that would be, if I were a coach still, that would be my strategy. Yeah, I mean, Giro in early October overlapped with the Vuelta in late October, finishing in November. So we go from a scorching sun Vuelta to probably a rainy and cold Vuelta. Um, I don't know. How do you see this year's Grand Tours develop and what challenges should we expect from teams and riders themselves? Um, so that the races are so late and with the weather, I think it's important that they are not too skinny, maybe. Um, to survive the cold better. And I'm really curious what's going to happen with both that situation that, that maybe mountains are going to be closed. But to be honest, also with the coronavirus. And I, it would really surprise me if all three Grand Tours are going to be finished from the first stage till the end, mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Because if one rider or one team member, you have, you have to imagine that you have, we were bringing eight riders, 25 staff members maybe so you have 35 per team and if one what happens when somebody gets the coronavirus in the first week of the grand tour and it's over yeah yeah it's over so 
I think uh, maybe focusing on one-day races would have been better. <laughs> well, yeah, a lot of uncertainty and I think natural speculation. So let's just see how this situation unfolds and hope that we can guarantee the safety of the riders and all the staff involved. Turn, so let's start wrapping up here. What final messages regarding some of the things we talked today? Or it could also be about the importance of this integration of coaches, sports scientists, and perhaps nutritionists as well, working together in post-cycling. Yeah, I think it's important that the all three, let's say coaches, sports scientists, and nutrition, and together with the cyclist, are working together. Because you cannot see those things separately and I think it can also be a mistake to see it separately because nutrition has to do with training and training has to do with sports science so it should be the three or four together should make a plan which is the best for the cyclist and looking to science I think it's important for sports scientists working in the field to try to publish things or at least to share the knowledge they have because it's really important to get the, the cycling further I think. I love it, Ton, and it's so good to hear that from someone who worked along with a pro cycling team, who knows the level of organization, planning it carries with, the demands of such events, and just what we've been insisting here on the podcast from the beginning, which is, if everyone does their job, whether it is on a pro cycling team or any other sport, the athlete is the one who benefits at the end. I really want to believe that we are past the era of doctors and coaches doing nutrition, so let's hope we keep pushing pushing on that same direction and your appeal here contributes to that. The same goes for the science around cycling and data that some teams might eventually be afraid of sharing, which is understandable up to a certain point, but these data could also be important to help the sport move forward, otherwise we are destined to publish case studies forever. Turn, as usual, I would ask for your social media profile so people can keep up with your social media interactions. I have a Twitter account. It's at the underscore thing. And it's a, it's a little bit a strange name, but in, when I started in the team in 2012, some writers made this name because they want to make this, this kind of same account for the stick with the television program. So that's why it's the thing. Okay, interesting. Uh, good to know, Tun. I'll make sure people find you and I'll include your Twitter profile on the show notes for this episode on fullthepedal.com. Tun, this talk was a breath of fresh air. It was an honor having you here uh, sharing this information with us. So much valuable content from someone with true experience on the field. And for that, Tun, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. And If listeners are interested in more details, you can download my thesis at my ResearchGate account. So it's available there. Good point. I'll include your ResearchGate profile as well as the link for your thesis. Thanks again, Turn. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. And there you go, episode 29 with Ton van Erp, a really nice guy to talk with and someone who brought us different insights than usual here to the podcast. And I just love the fact that Ton acknowledged the importance of the nutritionist inside a world tour cycling team. I truly hope you found this information useful and I hope to keep on having you on that side listening to Feel the Pedal. Thanks for tuning in and take care, boys and girls.